Typically when someone thinks about XDG, they're probably going to think about something like your XDG user directory. So things like your documents folder, music, desktop pictures, so on and so forth, and how to actually configure them. Or maybe you think about something like the XDG base directory environment variables. So things like your data dir, cache dir, config dir, and all of those. Or maybe you think about something like XDG mime and XDG open for consistently launching up applications. But why are all of these under the XDG banner and where does all of this even come from? And maybe what else is under this banner as well? So in the year 2000, a new group was formed by Havoc Pennington of Red Hat and that group was called the X Desktop Group or XDG for short. Now, the X in their name is actually supposed to be pronounced as cross, but like with Parsix, which no one has ever said, no one has ever pronounced the X in XDG as cross. So it's supposed to be the cross desktop group or cross DG, but both of those sound really dumb and I'm never going to say it like that again. Now, since the formation of the group, they actually have changed their name from XDG to freedesktop.org, but the XDG moniker has actually stuck around for a lot of their projects, especially the older ones, but even newer projects sometimes get that moniker, and that's because some of them would be named in a really confusing way without it. So, for example, XDG Utils. If you just drop the XDG, it becomes Utils, and you don't really know what it's actually talking about. Now, this group was formed to work on interoperability and a shared base technology among desktop environments working under X11 and Wayland. So instead of having, say, GNOME, KDE, and XFC all doing their own separate ways to open up applications, they can all rely on the same standards to make it so it's much easier to actually move between these systems. And I feel like at this stage, they sort of achieved their goal in that respect. Now, at the time of the formation of the group, Wayland didn't actually exist yet because Wayland is actually a free desktop.org project that didn't come into existence, at least publicly, until 2008. Now, unlike something such as POSIX, which is a strict standard created by the IEEE for what a Unix system should be to be interoperable, the free desktop isn't actually a strict standard. Some of the projects under their banner even replace each other. Basically, the free desktop is a group for discussing ideas and directing Linux in a certain direction with an aim towards interoperability. Now, because it's just a group for discussing ideas, it has much more room to actually change the things that are going on in the world compared to stricter standards out there. But this isn't always a good thing because it can lead to things changing in ways that they probably shouldn't change, interfaces changing, basically just making it a bit more confusing, but it does allow for adaptations to newer technology to be made considerably quicker. Now, I have been bringing up POSIX throughout this video, but I'm not saying that because it's a competing standard or anything like that. They achieve very, very different jobs. I only bring up POSIX because it's an example of a strict standard. Because this isn't a strict standard, there is no certification saying this is a free desktop approved desktop environment and there's no requirement to actually implement all the specifications. But as with POSIX, if you're going to half implement the specification, stop at the specification borders, don't half implement a specific spec. Because if you half implement a spec, then I have no idea what's actually going to be contained inside of the spec. And I have to go look at your documentation rather than the documentation for the spec. And it just makes it way more confusing than it really needs to be. Now, even though there's no certification, a lot of their tools and specifications are still in wide use, and this is because GNOME, KDE, and XFC, three very notable desktop environments, all collaborate with freedesktop.org, and some of their apps are even hosted on free desktop servers. And this all started in 2006 with the help of KDE and GNOME when they all started a project called the Portland Project, or better known as XDG Utils, which contains things like XDG Open, XDG Mime, XDG Desktop Icon, XDG Desktop Menu, and things like that. And this project went and actually implemented a lot of the specifications that we'll be discussing in just a bit, and this was actually to commit to interoperability and show that these specifications actually work in a real-world desktop environment rather than just being a theoretical way that this could be handled. So some of the specifications in wide use include things like the auto start spec, which specifies how an app should be started on login or how removable media can request a specific application to be executed or things like desktop entries and desktop menus, which were implemented inside of desktop icon and desktop menu. So this actually specifies how a .desktop file should be made. So how it contains your app icon, name, description, so on and so forth, and then how to actually build menus from these files. 
or things like how file URIs will be handled when dragging and dropping files between graphical applications, or things like the Media Player Remote Interfacing Specification, otherwise known as Empress, which is a DBus interface for controlling media players. And if you want to go find out more about that, I did a video on Player CTL, which will be linked up there. And also things like XML Bookmark Exchange Language, which is a standard for exchanging browser bookmarks, or perhaps things like your Linux trash can. I'm sure that you've probably heard of one of these, but if you haven't, there is a full list down below to all of the specifications on the free desktop.org website. And there are some others that aren't seeing widespread use right now, but maybe one day that will actually change. So things like the MIME application specification or X settings or thumbnail or things like desktop couch. Maybe one day these will become very important specifications that tons of applications are actually using and are basically integrated into every desktop environment. But right now, these are sort of ideas that are floating around the group. And because there's no certification process, they can't actually force any of these changes to happen. They sort of have to put the ideas out there and then wait for people to come across them and then see if they're actually good ideas. But it's not like this group just churns out specifications and doesn't actually work on projects with other groups or implement things themselves. They've worked on things like, say, Dbus for inter-process communication. Or maybe you've heard of something like Network Manager, which is for network discovery and configuration for wired and wireless networks. Or how about Pulse Audio, which is very, very quickly becoming the de facto standard for sound systems on Linux. And even if you don't want to use Pulse Audio, a lot of applications are basically requiring you to actually use it. Or maybe you've used something like Font Config for configuring your font access. Or if you're using NVIDIA, you might have used the Novo drivers, which are the reverse engineered NVIDIA graphics drivers. Or how about Lib Input, which is an interface for input devices like keyboards, mice, and touchpads. And if you ever had to configure anything with a mouse or a touchpad, you've probably had to interact with the application. And curiously, both Xorg and Wayland are both under the Free Desktop banner. Xorg is developed by the Xorg Foundation, who actually joined Free Desktop in 2018, and Wayland is developed by free desktop themselves. So basically every single relevant graphic server on Linux is under the free desktop banner, which is sort of amusing to me. Those were the ones that caught my eye, but if you wanna have a scroll through this list here and actually see what other applications are on here, have a look for yourself and see if there's anything else you recognize, like maybe something like Mesa, or I think GStream is on this list as well. So there's a bunch of projects on this list. And as you can see, this is a very important group for the way that the Linux desktop actually functions today. But amusingly, no one seems to acknowledge the fact that this group actually exists. Even though they have all of this power over the direction of the Linux desktop, no one really cares about what they're doing. But even if you want to avoid the free desktop applications, in a lot of instances, it's not actually possible because a lot of applications seem to think that the various free desktop applications are actually standards and don't actually let you configure it to use something else. One common example of this is applications that rely on XDG Open. So even though there are replacements to XDG Open, if the application you're trying to work with only lets you use that, you're kind of stuck using it. Now, if you happen to care, the GitLab instance that stores all of freedesktop.org software is hosted by the Portland State University, which is sponsored by HP, Intel, and Google. Now, one thing that sort of interests me about all of this is the fact that no one really is bothered by freedesktop.org even though they are a Red Hat project. And it being a Red Hat project is one of the reasons I've seen people complain about System D. But I guess it's because freedesktop.org doesn't really do anything that controversial, unlike something like your init system. So I guess it's just because no one really cares that they exist. So I think that's pretty much everything for me. But before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Joachim, Corbinian, Andrew, Craig, Nathan, Montezachi, Kobento, Joseph, Pitty, Rode, Tony, Brennan, Donald, John, Marek, Mikkel, Nate, Dog, Nephite, Tease, and Zilva. If you want to go and support my work, there's links down below to my subscribe star, Patreon, LibrePay, all of that sort of stuff. I've got my podcast, Tech Over Tea, available basically anywhere. And this channel is available on Library, Odyssey, BitTube, BitChute, and other platforms as well. If you want to watch it somewhere that isn't YouTube. So I think that's pretty much everything for me, and I'm out.